Romulus is a new television show that depicts events leading up to the founding of Rome. And since today is Rome's birthday, I thought it would be fun to look at the language that is used in this show. Because this show is remarkable for two reasons. One, it depicts a part of history and or legend that is seldom dealt with, the founding of Rome by Romulus. And the other is that it uses archaic proto-Latin, or does it, in all of its scenes. So before I get into some detailed analysis of the first episodes, I'll call it language because to call it Latin might not exactly be fair. My general overview is that Wow, these actors are working really hard. Really, they should get all kinds of praise for being able to act competently and believably in a language that isn't only not their native language, but is a reconstructed form of an ancient language that has barely been attested. So that's really cool. So any criticisms I have definitely aren't levied at the messengers here, the actors. But in general, I'd like to praise them. There are some basic things. The essential elements of classical Latin pronunciation, that is in how that pronunciation system is different from the ecclesiastical pronunciation, is maintained here. Because, of course, most of these actors are Italian, and Italians aren't used to the classical pronunciation anyway of Latin. So it's fantastic to hear a nice W sound where it's appropriate, as well as a hard G and G where it's appropriate. So all of that is excellent, and I'm glad they obviously incorporated that. Also, I hear a lot of actors using what sounds like a retracted S sound. As you've heard me talk about in other videos, languages that don't have a SH sound usually don't have a laminal S sound like I do as an English speaker, but they have a slightly retracted sound. So it's SH, and the pitch is slightly lower. So S is how I normally say S, but SH is how it sounds usually in Dutch, Finnish, Icelandic, and Modern Greek, as well as European Spanish. So that retracted S sound can be heard in a lot of the actors' voices, and I think that's great. That's a nice detail. But other than that, the most important part of Proto-Indo-European languages up to a certain century, shall I say, and certainly for all forms of ancient Latin, is that there should be phonemic vowel length maintained. And essentially, we don't hear that at all. Another really, really important actor that goes into the pronunciation of Latin before the classical period, all the way until about the year 250 BC, according to some analyses, is that every single Latin word was stressed on the first syllable. And that the 3rd century BC is when that transition was occurring, where we now stress Latin words, as we do in the classical period, of course, according to the penultimate stress rule. And that says that if the penultimate, or second-to-last syllable, is a long syllable in Latin, it gets the stress, and if not, it goes back to the third-to-last syllable. And since this show, Romulus, takes place in the 8th century BC, we're dealing with a very archaic Proto-Latin, and perhaps even a Proto-Italic, maybe it hasn't fully differentiated in the various Italic languages like Oscan, Umbrian, and Feliscan, as well as Latin, then we absolutely have to have that initial stress. Instead, we essentially hear the penultimate stress rule maintained for the most part. And that's pretty disappointing because it's really easy to do. Just tell the actors to hammer the first syllable in every word and it'll sound okay. Just like Finnish, Hungarian, Czech, and other languages, which also happen to have phonemic vowel length. It would be a perfect match. I'd like to add that since the actors are for the most part Italian, they sound great. You know, it sounds like it's really authentically something from Italy from an ancient period. If you just listen to it... <laughs> It sounds like it could be an archaic form of Latin. It won't sound like the Latin that people hear in church for the most part, obviously, because it doesn't sound like ecclesiastical Latin. And it won't sound like classical Latin outside of Italy either. And that helps give it, to the untrained ear perhaps, a sense of authenticity. But like I mentioned, phonemic vowel length isn't there. We don't have the stress on the initial so... These are really the most important parts of ancient, archaic, proto-Latin. Why are they not here is what I'd ask. Again, I think the actors are doing a great job. 
and overall, the feeling and quality of it is good. So let's analyze some things more specifically. I won't analyze all of the text because, well, I don't have the text. All I can do is pick out most of what's being said, and I can understand it with the subtitles, but this is not the language I speak. This is not the classical Latin or standard Latin that we study in school and that we learn to speak. So unlike in the Barbarians review videos, which you can see here and here, and yes, I will be reviewing episode three of Barbarians sometime. Just be patient. Stay subscribed. Thanks. Unlike in the Barbarians episodes reviews, I was able to understand pretty much all of the Latin because it's, again, the same language that I'm used to speaking every day. This, however, is taking a lot of liberties, especially with the reconstruction of the phonology. And one of the things that the actors do a lot of, which is probably beneficial, is they obscure what they're saying by mumbling a lot. <laughs> And there's nothing wrong with that. It has two benefits. One is that normally when people speak, they don't enunciate clearly. So that makes it feel indeed truly authentic, like people are really having a conversation, not like it's some kind of play on a stage. So that's fine, even though it prevents me from understanding more clearly what they're saying. And it also masks what they do wrong. Things like phonemic vowel length isn't there, or the stress isn't on the first syllable, that kind of stuff. Because it's literally harder to hear, I can't pick out the problems as well. Nevertheless, there are things which are just strange. Okay, so in this little exchange, we hear these two brothers, who aren't Romulus and Remus, by the way, they say Breiter for brother, and then Freiter for brother. So here's the problem with that. The Proto-Indo-European beginning of the sound is b. This becomes brother in English, and it becomes frater in classical Latin. So this is Proto-Latin, right? It's already supposed to be at least somewhat differentiated from the rest of Proto-Italic. So it should at least be like Proto-Italic. Proto-Italic is already reconstructed with the word frater, exactly like classical Latin, essentially. There is one caveat. It almost certainly is not a true labiodental fa, but a bilabial fricative fa, so frater. But we don't hear that. And also the vowel is the more archaic vowel. Why would that be? And the fact that we have both breiter and freiter immediately after it indicates probably a script problem, a lack of quality control perhaps from either the script writers or multiple script writers. Interestingly, this is the exact same issue that Raphael Turigiano and I identified in our analysis of a piece of the script of the movie which spurred this on, which is Il Primo Re, The First King, which is about Romulus and Remus. I understand that this show Romulus is made by the same people who made Il Primo Re. So it's a shame to see the exact same error of having tried to do the archaic proto-indo-european thing and then a slightly more italic thing but then not being consistent within the same scene it's like what well, it doesn't make sense especially since proto-italic was already frater or frater why would it be otherwise it's just it doesn't make sense to me why that was chosen Luis Moynos. Here we hear something that I think is really good. He says, moinus for munus, a word for gift. So moinus, a lot of u in classical Latin come from an oi sound that preceded it. For example, unu, one in classical Latin is from oinu in the more archaic form of Latin, in proto or old Latin. <laughs> Mao, they got the. And it's called a Mao. The show has completely redeemed itself to me. It's got a Mao, so it's fine. I forgive everything. All it needed was this one Mao. And in that phrase, we hear de conti. So this in classical Latin or standard Latin is de cunt. It means they say. And it comes from an earlier word, de cunt. The problem here is the e. So the vowel is switched, which is right, de, gond, that's all fine. The o later closes to u in classical Latin. And the de is that diphthong, which becomes a d later and then eventually d. So all of that is great. The problem is it ends in e. 
Proto-Italic, which is the language that should precede this Proto-Latin, already didn't have that anymore. That final E ending is found in the third person of verbs in Proto-Indo-European and even in Proto-Hellenic. In Greek words, the third person plural ending was very similar to the Latin one. In Latin, it's usually und or ant or ent, that is in classical Latin. And in ancient Greek, it's regularly usi a lot of the time. And that usi in standard ancient Greek is from onti. The onti becomes onti, and then the onsi becomes onsi, and it creates a nasalization of the preceding vowel, and then you get osi, which becomes usi. There you go. The problem, though, is that Proto-Italic didn't have this anymore. Again, the parent language of this archaic form of Latin, or even if this is just supposed to be Proto-Italic, it should not be e. It should not be unti at all. Just be ont, de cont. And unfortunately, that is consistent throughout the show. So I don't know what the translators were doing exactly or why they would include this when I've never seen a Proto-Italic reconstruction that includes this final e sound at the end of third person verbs. It's really cool what they're doing, but this particular thing just utterly baffles me. And it makes me wonder, is there a quality control issue? Uh, again, I understand if it's, you know, the actors on set can't do everything perfectly, but this is consistent throughout the show. So I'm pretty sure that this is part of the script and it was intended. So I'm, I don't really, I don't really follow why it would be like Proto-Indo-European, more archaic than the Proto-Italic parent language of what we should be hearing here. And in this scene, we hear esti, the word est which is, in fact, also how it's reconstructed in Proto-Italic, is given as esti, which is very much like it is in Ancient Greek and also in Proto-Indo-European. And that's really cool, except that, again, Proto-Italic shouldn't have that final e sound anymore. A final vowel sound seems to get added onto this word in some other Italic dialects. For example, in Pompeii, there has been a discovery of este, which is really interesting. It means either we have people who just aren't used to ending with a consonant and they prefer to end a vowel. A lot of Greek speakers are in Pompeii. Maybe that's why they added it. It could have perhaps been something inherited through Proto-Italic that just wasn't attested anywhere else normally. And this Pompeian discovery of este could be what led to the modern Romanian don't forget Romanian, yes, they. But for the third person verbs in general, I just don't think this final e sound should be there. <laughs> Omnia no beis duena. Here's a nice one where we hear omnia no beis duena, which I think sounds great. We have duena, which becomes bona in classical Latin, so that dua becomes ba. We have even a vestige of that in English. The word dual is from the word duellum, which is a word that gets preserved from archaic Latin into classical Latin as an allotrope, that is a secondary borrowing of the same archaic language, except the normal way that we have the word bellum, which means war, that comes from duellum, the more archaic word, into bellum, but duellum also gets preserved as a separate meaning for duel instead of war. <laughs> That sounds really cool. It has the gu sound that we expect to be there, even in Proto-Italic, which becomes, of course, konwenyunt. The problem, of course, is that it's ending in the e, which I don't think should be there in any Proto-Italic or descendant of it. And here we also hear dimeje, which is great because the z, this intervocalic s, becomes a z sound. And that ja is what leads to what's called rhoticism, where we have now dimere. So the infinitives that we have in Latin that survive in, say, Spanish and Italian, for example, that have this r, this r sound in it, dimere in classical Latin, come from a dimeje. And we hear that here, and I think it sounds really cool. And then I wonder what they're up to again. We hear meter. The proto-italic word for mother is Mater, very much like classical Latin mater. So why is it meter? Why is it preserving the archaic vowel e, which should have become a in all the Italic languages by now? Maybe because it looks more like Greek? Is that what they're doing? They're trying to imitate ancient Greek in some ways. That's why we have these e endings. Feliskin, Oskin, South Piscine, and Umbrian all attest mater or something like it. It doesn't seem to make sense to me why it should be meter 
at all. Why should it be like Proto-Indo-European here? Deixerad Arcton. Laiuad Medies. This is odd. Why is it not Medides? The Latin word Medides, which means midday or south, because the sun is in the south when it's in the midday, it should be Medides here. And this is a different form of rhoticism, where we have an intervocalic D becoming an R sound. So Medides becomes Medides in classical Latin. But here we're missing a whole syllable, so this just seems odd. I don't know why it's like this. Here the word princeps sounds a bit out of place. It sounds a little bit too evolved, too much like classical Latin that comes like hundreds of years later, because the proto-italic word is prisemocaps. So that should be what we'd expect to hear if they're going for proto-italic. And this brings up another perhaps small issue, which is that when you're dealing with reconstructing a language which is barely attested at all, well, what do you do? It makes perfect sense to have it in some kind of classical Latin and then archaize it back. But it's like they didn't archaize all of the words or completely. And there are idiomatic expressions here which sound just like classical Latin. I've heard nekesest or nekesest, actually, which again shouldn't be how you say it. But that's fine because what else are you going to do? If you have to write a script, obviously you should use classical Latin because it's a language you can speak and communicate in. But if they're archaizing so far back that it's like Proto-Indo-European with having the e suffix for the third person verbs, then why is it brinkeps? Why is it not the Proto-Italic word here? It doesn't seem to make sense. It seems like those would be centuries apart. They're trying to do Proto-Italic, but just doing stuff that's way too much like classical Latin, or also way too much like Proto-Indo-European at the same time for it to really make sense. Queer. This is odd. I hear queer, but the word for why is quor in Proto-Italic. So I don't get this, because we have a quor, which gets compressed into gur for why in classical Latin. I don't understand quor. <laughs> It's not quor, and why it's queer here. That doesn't seem like that would ever be reconstructed in the antecedent of Latin. Yeah. Quite db. This one's odd too, because I hear quite db, and it's odd because the word for what is quid, even in Proto-Italic. So. What is this quiet thing I'm hearing? I don't really follow. And uh, of course, this is idiomatically from classical Latin, quid tibi, quid tibi est. What's up with you? What's going on? It could be neutral or it could be like, hey, what's wrong? So good idiom. Of course, they should use a classical Latin idiom because what other idiom are they going to use? That's fine. But it's also tibi, but in proto-italic, which is what they seem to be going for, it's tevei. It's even an intervocalic v sound. So tevei, why is it tibi? As if the vowels have already closed. That doesn't happen until late Old Latin period. Just so you know, by the way, classical Latin is understood as going from about 100 BC to about 200 AD. So essentially everyone who precedes the lives of Cicero and Caesar, even authors like Plautus and Terence, they're considered to be in the late Old Latin period. And even this, this could be considered Old Latin too, I guess, just a really archaic form of it, or Proto-Latin, or Proto-Italic, or whatever. There's no real clear lines exactly, because there's not a lot of literature attested to really help us understand the transitions. So there doesn't seem to be a good reason for this to be Guaidibi instead of Guiteve, which is what I would expect. I don't understand why, what is going on here. I get the impression that the script was translated into classical Latin, and then they archaize things, but not systematically, and not very carefully. I don't know. Clearly someone went to a lot of work to do this. I don't feel like it's particularly fair for me to pick this to death, which is why I'm going to stop here with the specific scene analysis. It's just sort of like, why? Because you could just ask me, hello, salve, or tens of thousands of other people who could just, you know, look up 
a book on proto-italic and find what these forms ought to be if you're going for proto-italic, which is reasonably clearly reconstructed, or if there's it's definitely an intent to do something more archaic, like Proto-Indo-European. Okay, that's interesting. But then why have other things like the Prinkeps, which we saw, which are clearly way more advanced even than the standard reconstruction of Proto-Italic? On the whole, we have the aesthetic of a foreign language, foreign even to fluent speakers, of Latin today, which is cool. Until you listen more closely and you realize that, wait a minute, this just doesn't quite make sense. So then I would question, why do this? In The Barbarian's Show, we have a really good reconstruction of idiom and pronunciation of Latin from the first century AD. And while it's not perfect, we don't expect the actors or the writers, translators, you know, all these things have to come together to make a show. And I can assure you, just making a little YouTube video takes a huge amount of time and effort. So especially when you maybe have the help of multiple people, but then you have to collaborate together. It's very difficult. So I can understand why things aren't perfect. But these problems seem to be in the original translation from, I would assume, a normal standard Latin into an archaized form. And then I would question, why do it? For example, if we have a movie today about King Arthur, would we want to put it in Middle English? But if that figure, who's also and similarly legendary and pseudo-historical at best, if not purely mythological, much like the stories of Romulus and Remus are very legendary and at best, this pseudo-historical, if not just pure mythology. Well, we want to have something that's done in a poorly reconstructed version of Old English or Middle English? It would sound kind of cool, and the actors would get a lot of credit for doing something that's difficult. I mean, they have to act, they have to emote, they have to affect each other with dramatic action with a language that they barely understand except from the translations they might remember. If you don't speak the language, then they're really putting a lot into the performance. Again, I respect this tremendously. This is not easy. But I question then the motive for doing it at all. Why not just have it in ecclesiastical Latin pronunciation? I'm not kidding. It's not historical, no, but it's really effective because if you have an Italian cast, then all they have to do is just pronounce it in the traditional way. And since this is a show made mostly by Italians and largely for an Italian audience, why not just do that. I think that would be a lot easier, save a lot of time, a lot of strain on the actor's part, because if they're not going to go to the effort of some really obvious things to me, like me, like, like breiter and then freiter, but we also have mater, these things just can't happen within the same version of archaic Latin or proto-Italic at the same time. You have to pick one type of formation or transformation. That said, I still think all of this is good. It's good to do these historical things. It's good to do these beautiful costumes and sets and all these really fantastic things. Attempting to reconstruct the language, I think that's all laudable. I think it could have been pretty easy to take it to a point where I wouldn't notice some of the things I talked about. But still, I'd rather things like this exist than not. If you'd like to know a little bit more about what the ancient Romans actually recorded regarding the founding of Rome, I've made a companion video to this one on my other channel, Scorpio Martianus, which is all in Latin and ancient Greek. And in that video, I tell you in Latin direct quotes from the historian Livy about the events of the founding of Rome. Check the description for the link to that video. Have you seen this Romulus TV show? What do you think about it? Have you enjoyed it? Do you like the show? I haven't commented on the show itself because I'd rather just keep this based on the language. I'm not trying to give a movie review, but I'd love to hear what you think about it, whether you liked it or disliked it. Thanks so much for watching. Thanks above all to all of my Patreon supporters. We'll see you next time. Mualete.